The psalmist says, There is none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart. To fear your name. Well, we're going to begin this morning by singing a different psalm, but number 138 in our blue books. I'll praise you, Lord, with heart content and joyful. Before the world, I'll tell your righteous ways. Number 138.
Well, as we sit, let's join our hearts together in prayer. Let's pray. Lord, our God, how gladly we come together this morning to join our hearts in praise and to exalt your name and to sing your worthy praise. For there is none like you, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. You alone are the King of the ages, the Lord of a timeless kingdom of grace and mercy and love and of abounding and abundant righteousness. The glory of that righteousness one day will fill this whole world to the praise of your glorious grace and to the blessing of all those with whom you have deigned to share your eternal glory through Jesus Christ, your Son, and through what he has done to call to yourself a people after your own name. So, Lord, our hearts are indeed content and joyful this morning in Jesus Christ, our Lord, joyful in knowing the meaning and the purpose of this world and of knowing our own place, our own purpose too in our lives in this world as we're called to share in the task of extending that kingdom, to see its triumph, to know its joy, and to know above all the wonder of having a part in your marvelous purposes of grace which are everlasting. And so, Lord, we pray this morning that you would help us to know more and more, day by day, your ways and your touch upon our lives so that we might bring more of the beauty and the brightness of Christ himself ever more visibly through our lives into the lives of others that they also might share the joy that you have shared with us and know the wonder of the Savior himself and the blessedness of being his. So, Lord, as we gather this morning on this Lord's Day, we pray that you would draw near to us to teach us, to lead us, to guide us, to rule in our lives that we might be nearer followers of yours that we might know the blessing of your presence upon us and within us as we seek to live day by day for the Lord Jesus Christ who is our Lord and our Savior and our King. So draw near to us we ask as we draw near to you in faith open our eyes and open the eyes of our hearts that you might teach us your way and that we might know nothing more wonderful and joyful than to follow you in that way all the days of our lives. So hear us, Lord, in this, our morning prayer. For we ask it all in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Well, let me welcome you again to uh, our fellowship this morning. Whether you're up here and uh, I can see you, or whether you're downstairs, I hope you can see and hear and uh, we'll look forward to meeting you in person uh, at the end of the service. Can I draw your attention to these sheets? Uh, you ought to all have one on your seat or um, somebody put it into your hand on the way in. There are numbers of notices there that tell you what's going on in the life of the church in this coming week. Uh, you'll see that we gather again this evening at 6.30 for our evening service. Bob File will be continuing his series in Ruth and uh, downstairs uh, we'll be uh, studying in Farsi. Uh, the Sermon on the Mount, as we will be uh, here this morning. So do join us this evening and uh, use that opportunity to meet again, to share with one another, and to encourage one another uh, in the Lord. In the middle panel there, you see all the different things going on this week. Release the Word starts up again on Thursday and the International Bible Study, so do note that. Uh, please be praying also for Christianity Explored going on on Thursday night. This will be the third week coming and uh, we need your prayers for that. And uh, regarding prayer, you'll see on Wednesday evening, 7.30, it is our 
uh, congregational prayer meeting, our fortnightly prayer meeting. Do come and join us as we pray together, uh, principally for the work of Christ all around the world with our mission partners, with others uh, throughout the nation that we partner in the gospel with, uh, and of course for our own work here. So please uh, do come and join us, 7.30 on Wednesday, uh, if you possibly can. A few notices to note there on the right-hand side uh, under Nota Bene. This afternoon, I'm having a meeting for those who are considering church membership. That is, if you've been uh, worshiping here with us for a while, if you consider this the church that you want to belong to and serve the Lord in, please do come along and uh, hear about making that formal uh, as becoming a member of of the fellowship here. Five o'clock this afternoon. And then below that, you'll see after the evening service tonight, Uh, The Robry family, who are uh, soon to be returning to their missionary service in Nigeria, Uh, we have an opportunity after the evening service to hear a little from them, to have an update on their work, and uh, to know how we can pray for them as they prepare uh, to return to Nigeria in a few weeks' time. So do come along and uh, support them and hear how you can uh, the better pray for them. Well, I'll let you uh, read these notice sheets later uh, at your leisure. Please do do that and uh, keep these beside you as you pray for the work of the church this coming week so that we can all be in prayer uh, together. But we're going to turn now to our Bible readings. And uh, you'll find that in Matthew's Gospel at chapter 4. If you have one of our church visitors' Bibles, that's page 809. And uh, we are beginning... Uh, This morning, a new study, which will take us, uh, I suspect, the next few months through into the summertime, if summer is ever going to come. And we're going to be looking at the Sermon on the Mount. So today, we are really introducing ourselves to that, and we're going to read from Matthew chapter 4 at verse 12 through to chapter 5, verse 12. Now, when Jesus heard that John, that is John the Baptist, had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah may be fulfilled. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region and the shadow of death, on them has the light dawned. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left the nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. And he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his frame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, epileptics, and paralytics, and he healed them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis, and from Jerusalem and Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain. And when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
And blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Amen. And may God bless to us this, his word. Well, we're going to sing again now the hymn on the screens, which is taken from the Psalms, but echoes the spirit of the teaching of the Sermon on the Mount. Teach me thy way, O Lord. Teach me thy way.
Just before we pray and uh, to help us in prayer this morning, let me uh, share one or two uh, things with you. We've been praying much as a congregation for the congregation of St. Silas and for the new ministry uh, about to begin there. And I'm delighted that we have uh, Martin and Kathy Ayers with us this morning. Martin is going to be inducted as the new minister there on Tuesday evening. And we want to assure you of our prayers and our ongoing prayers as a congregation for you and uh, for that new beginning there. Another church that we have been much in prayer for over recent months and uh, the last year or so is uh, Edinburgh North Church, uh, a church that uh, has gone through much uh, of a similar thing that we have gone through in formerly being part of the Church of Scotland, but for the last 18 months has been uh, meeting together in Edinburgh and uh, various uh, friends of ours who we've been particularly associated with have been helping them in the ministry there and of course we've been sending preachers. Uh, and I'm delighted to tell you that they have also now uh, got somebody who they hope will be their minister and is going to be their sole nominee preaching for them on the last Sunday of this month. And uh, we're delighted uh, for them and we're delighted for this new beginning for them. And we're particularly delighted because the person that they have called to be sole nominee is somebody of such outstanding quality. And you all know who it is. His name is Rupert Hunt Taylor. He's one of ours. And so, although we're very sad that uh, in all likelihood, Rupert and Jen, the family, will be moving on from us and moving east to Edinburgh, we are very, very delighted indeed for the possibilities that that new ministry holds and for all that that will mean. And so, of course, we want to have them very much in our prayers over the next few weeks. Uh, they'll not be leaving us until the summertime at the earliest, which is good news. But uh, you'll be wanting to pray for them very particularly and for the congregation there and especially for that service on the 31st of January. So as we pray now, let's come to the Lord and in particular, let's remember uh, these new beginnings. Our gracious God and Father, how we thank you that you have promised us that you are building your church and that nothing in this world and nothing in any world can stop that marvelous purpose of yours, not even the gates of hell themselves. And we thank you, Lord, that even in our own land, where, as we look around, there is so much it would seem to discourage us about the state of the Christian church in these islands, that even here you are building your church, and where your gospel is truly proclaimed, and where your people live witnessing that gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The light is shining in the darkness and your church is being formed and is growing and is expanding and is sending out workers into the harvest field to bring the message of Jesus to this dark world. We thank you, Lord, for our neighbors in the West End and soon to be very near neighbors to us just across Kelvin Grove Park. We thank you for the congregation there at St. Silas. We thank you for sustaining them during this long period of interregnum waiting for uh, Martin to be able to come. But we thank you, Lord, that this Tuesday evening will mark that new beginning. And we pray that amid the joy and the excitement and all that that will mean for the congregation, that at the very heart of it, from the very beginning, would be a commitment to your gospel truth which will be unswerving and unchanging and which will surely bear fruit for the glory of your kingdom in the months and years ahead. We pray for Martin and Kathy and the family as they settle here in Glasgow in home and schools and in the community. We ask that you would be with them and encourage them in these early days with friendships and with many who can help them and who will stand with them. We pray for the whole congregation that as they get to know them, you would bless them and enable them to work together for the glory of Christ, that many more people in that part of the city, surrounded as it is by university students and many others, that they might hear the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ and come to rejoice in him and to shine for him, that others also might see and come to hear his word. We thank you, Father, for the encouragement it is to us in the city here to have the beginning of another gospel ministry. And we ask 
that there would be many more such that in the years to come we would bring praise to you as we see the gospel planted in many parts of this city that many more might hear of Jesus and his word. And Lord, as we think across to the east, to the other place, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts with great joy for the way that you've led that fellowship in Edinburgh North in this past year or so. We thank you for the leaders that you have given them to wisely shepherd that people and to guide them through difficult days of transition and great disruption. We thank you for those who have been able to help with preaching and leading, our friend Peter Dixon and many others. But we thank you, Heavenly Father, that you have brought them together with Rupert and Jen and the family in a way that has been so clearly of your doing. We thank you for this opportunity that now presents itself. And we pray for Rupert as he goes to preach to the congregation there on the end of this month and ask that that day would be one that seals to them and to all the people there the rightness of this calling and that it would mark the beginning of something that will bear great fruit in that part of the world in the months and in the years to come. We thank you, Father, for the encouragement to us of seeing those whom you've called first to yourself and to your kingdom, even in our midst here, and then to your service, gifting in so many ways your servant, training and developing him and blessing us through him and his ministry here. And so we know that you have fitted him for that task there, and we have confidence to send him with our joyous blessing and with the promise of our prayers and our support, knowing that the gospel he knows and loves and proclaims and teaches so faithfully and so eloquently will produce great fruit for your name and will bring many to know the Lord Jesus Christ and train many to proclaim him. So, Lord, we have hearts full of thankfulness this morning and we pray that in these and in many other ministries in our nation you would be bringing strength and commitment and willing service to many churches in our land we think of others with whom we have such strong bonds and have done over recent months and years we think particularly of the fellowship at Gilcomston in Aberdeen, of Holyrood in Edinburgh, of Grace Church in Dundee, of Cornerstone in Stirling, and many others, Lord, beginning in fledgling days of a new situation, and yet having known amidst much turmoil the faithfulness and the rock-solid commitment of your hand of power to them to strengthen them and guide them and help them in all their needs. How we thank you, O God, for your commitment to your church and through your church to this world, which is indeed so greatly in darkness and so much in need of your gospel of light and of truth. We see a world around us stumbling in ignorance and foolishness, so much misery and pain, We see our own society in so desperate need of the light of the gospel's truth. We see a world at odds with each other, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. And we know, God, that the answer, the only answer ultimately for this world is the righteousness and the peace that comes where your scepter alone holds sway. And so, Lord, until the great day when your righteousness does fill this earth as the waters cover the sea, we pray for your kingdom to come, for the reign of Jesus to be known more and more throughout this earth where there are people who bow the knee to him and churches, communities are changed and transformed by the gracious power that comes from heaven through the word of his gospel grace. So, Lord, we ask that you would hear our prayers, 
that your kingdom come in this world, in our nation, in our city, in our church, and first of all, in our own hearts, that we might bow the knee gladly to you, our sovereign ruler and king, knowing that your way, the way of righteousness, the way of greatness, is the way of joy and the gladness and of perfect freedom. Slay in us, we pray, O God, every pretension that rises up from the sin in our own hearts to tell us that our way is a better way and a happier way and a more fruitful way. Remind us, we pray, even this very day, that the way of happiness, the way of joy, the way of fulfillment, the way of true peace is the way of our Lord Jesus Christ and the way of his word and the way of his work. So hear us, Lord, and as we come to your word, open our eyes that we might see wonderful things in this your law. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We continue in prayer as we sing our version of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father God, who dwells in heaven. Well, if you'd uh, turn with me back to Matthew's Gospel, uh, the passage we read, chapter 4 and 5, uh, I think page 809 if you have one of the uh, church Bibles. 
There's many things, uh, many things uh, I admire about my friend and uh, predecessor here, Sinclair Ferguson, but just one of the many areas of life where he leaves me in the shade is the realm of golf. As some of you know, Sinclair is a very, very good golfer. Maybe if you have a brain as big as his, it doesn't take you that long to prepare your sermon, so there's more time for the golf course, I don't know, but I've not been on the golf course for about 10 years, so that tells you how slow I am. But uh, I recall uh, Sinclair often speaking about golf, and uh, on a number of occasions speaking about Jack Nicklaus, who was uh, arguably the greatest golfer of all time. Uh, And more than that, actually, a very great sportsman in the true sense of the word. He was a great ambassador, wasn't he? A great role model. Not known for his misdemeanors, as uh, so many sportsmen seem to be uh, these days, but uh, for his sportsmanship, his generosity, and also for his great faithfulness uh, in his personal life, uh, too. But uh, Jack Nicklaus, uh, at the height of his powers, was an incredible golfer. And you wouldn't think, would you, that there was really very much uh, that Jack Nicklaus needed to know or to be taught still about the game of golf. But according to Sinclair... Uh, Every single year, Jack Nicklaus would go back to the very first coach that he had in his earliest days, a man called Jack Grout. Every single year, he would go back to him and he would say to him, Jack, I want you to teach me how to play golf. That sounds extraordinary, doesn't it? It sounds absolutely out of place. But you see, what made Jack Nicklaus such a great one was that he knew that the only way he would go on, the only way he would progress, was if he never, ever left behind the basics, the very heart of the game of golf. And I think that's a real lesson for us, for all of us, as we think about the Christian life. We must never, ever think that somehow we get beyond the stage where we need to go back to basics where we need to learn again what it means to be the people of the Lord Jesus, the people who belong to his revolutionary kingdom of grace. As we sang in that song, it was the daily prayer of the psalmist to say, teach me thy way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. And it's a constant need for every single one of us, no matter how long we've walked with Christ, to keep returning to the basics of the Christian life, to things as basic as the grip and the stance and the swing are uh, to the game of golf. To go back again and again to the Lord Jesus and say, teach me again. Teach me how to be a Christian. Teach me how to be one of your people, how to be part of your heavenly kingdom. Lord, teach me your way. And what better place to do that than to meditate upon the Lord's words in what we call the Sermon on the Mount. Now, we've just finished, haven't we, a long study in the whole of Luke's Gospel. And so we've been immersed in a lot of Jesus' teaching. But uh, we've tried to take the Gospel in larger chunks of text because if you want to get the message of a Gospel as a whole, that's what you have to do. That's how the Gospel writers expected their books to be read because they're telling us the whole story, aren't they, of Christ and his work. And you'll lose the thread, you'll lose the whole sense of the movement if you just take tiny sections of a few verses at a time. That's not the way to read or to teach the Gospels. But of course, there can also be great use from time to time to slow right down and to take time to meditate on some of the the profound detail of Jesus' teaching. And I think that's especially so where we have uh, deliberately recorded for us by the gospel writer uh, a section of Jesus' teaching that stands together as as a clear unity, both in focus and in purpose. And of course, that's exactly what we have in Matthew chapters 5 to 7. In fact, Matthew organizes his whole gospel around five uh, teaching sections just like that, where things are grouped together around a clear theme. And this is the first one. You come to chapter 10, you'll find there's a whole chapter all about real kingdom mission. In Matthew 13, there's a whole chapter all about real kingdom expectations, what we're to expect now and not yet. And in chapter 18, you have a whole section all about real kingdom churches and how the community of Christ is meant to behave. And then in chapter 24 and chapter 25, you have a whole section on the real kingdom judgment that is coming at the final coming of Jesus. But here in, in Matthew 5 to 7, right at the very start of Jesus' ministry, 
we have Jesus teaching all about what it means to be real kingdom people. People of true righteousness. And Jesus spells out unmistakably what are the marks of his true people and what their true mission is in this kingdom age. as lights to the world showing the, the heavenly morality and indeed the heavenly mentality of Christ to the world. And unafraid to declare the true message of the kingdom with that call that it makes to decisive change, to a decision which is fraught with destiny for all life and for all eternity. Well, these are vital things for us to know, aren't they? Vital things for us to keep on knowing. Just as, as little errors can creep into your golf swing and end up causing you to spend far too much time off the fairway and in the rough and perhaps even out of bounds altogether. Well, it's just the same, isn't it, in our Christian lives if we drift away from foundational matters. That's when we begin, isn't it, to drift off into the rough to get dangerously close to being out of bounds, dangerously close to disqualification. So between now and um, the early summer, we're going to go back to basics. We're going to be working on our swing, as it were. We're going to say to the Lord Jesus again, Lord, teach us your way. Teach us what it means to be your people. Show us the portrait that you've painted of what we're to be. Show us again your purpose that you've called us to in this life. Teach us the true practice of your heavenly ways for us here on earth to exhibit heavenly morality and a heavenly mentality to the people of this world. Help us to preach true Christianity to this world as you've taught us to do. And the handout uh, that you have there this morning, I think, will help you to see how we've broken this up into four parts into this uh, series that we're going to look together. So uh, next time, that's for you to take away so that you hopefully know where we're going and it gives you a bit of a road map. And next time we'll begin to focus on the Beatitudes where Jesus paints in these evocative words a portrait of true Christianity, showing us the marks of what it means to belong to his kingdom. But, but first today, before we get into the detail of it, um, to keep the golfing metaphor, if you like, we're going to be waggling on the tee. We're going to be getting ourselves just ready uh, to know the game that we're playing. Because I want us to be absolutely clear, clear in our minds, what the Sermon on the Mount really is about and what it's not about, and who it's about and who it's not about. Because, of course, this teaching doesn't just appear in a vacuum, does it? Unless we pay attention to the context, unless we see to whom Jesus is speaking and who he isn't speaking, we're going to misunderstand it totally. And sadly, that is very, very common uh, for the Sermon on the Mount. It is greatly misunderstood. The name, I suppose, is still pretty well known, even in our culture today. But I guess the content is only really vaguely familiar to people nowadays. And the meaning, I think, is almost completely lost altogether. For some, they look at the Sermon on the Mount and see it rather as a blueprint for society, something that with real effort could be attained and would bring about a sort of utopian world. It's just that society hasn't really properly espoused it, and that's why there's such disappointment. Um... Those of you who are into literature will know that that was what the novelist Tolstoy seemed to think and wrote about in one of his novels. For some, I guess for many in uh, our culture today, many who would perhaps still think of themselves as culturally Christian when they fill in a survey, well, for many it's a sort of um, plan for life that uh, is aimed at finding acceptance with God so that if you do your best and uh, mark up a good enough score then God will reward you with a place in heaven. For some, of course, there's uh, people who would confidently say, well, of course, that's me. I live by the Sermon on the Mount. That's my motto. Don't judge others and God won't judge you. Live and let live. That's my life. You see, you just need to begin to think about the ways people talk about the Sermon on the Mount to realize that it's really very popular, mostly among those people who have no real idea what it's about at all. Because if you really did understand what Jesus is teaching here, I think you would talk very differently from that. It's just impossible to speak in those kind of ways if you've really grasped the challenge of this teaching. 
So what is the Sermon on the Mount really all about? Well, it's quite simple. It is simply Jesus Christ, the true king of the world, the true king of all worlds, teaching us with complete authority what life in his kingdom is about and what life in his kingdom looks like for those who truly belong to him as kingdom people. Or to put it another way, it's what the only right and appropriate response is to the news that the kingdom of God has begun on earth because the true king has arrived in the person of Jesus Christ. Look at uh, chapter 4, verse 17, which marks the very beginning of Jesus' proclamation of his kingdom. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, that is, it's upon you. Look down then to verse 23. Jesus went everywhere doing what? Teaching and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. And then immediately, look at chapter 5, verse 2. We read, he opened his mouth and he taught them. And we have the whole of this great teaching sermon. Until, if you look over to chapter 7, verse 28, you'll see that it says, when he finished all these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching. Now you see, between these things, these statements, beginning of chapter 5 and the end of chapter 7 there, Matthew has deliberately summarized all these great teaching sessions of Jesus for his readers so that we also can have the explanation of what Jesus meant when he said, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In verse 17, he calls for repentance and for the life of God's kingdom. And this, you see, the Sermon on the Mount shows us what that life of true repentance looks like. It's the life of true kingdom righteousness. You see, for Jesus, in a sense, repentance and righteousness are the same thing. And it's this repentant righteousness, or righteous repentance, if you want to put it that way, it's that that is the great mark of his true people, the people of God's kingdom, the people of God's king. That's why it's vital that we pay attention to the context. Look at chapter 5, verse 1. Matthew makes it very clear, doesn't he, that this teaching is given specifically and deliberately to those that he has already called to be his people. When he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them. See, that's so important, isn't it? This teaching is for his disciples. In fact, the whole sermon generally and and the Beatitudes in particular, paint a portrait of a true disciple of Jesus the King, what the disciple of Jesus looks like in the flesh. And in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus describes this countercultural living that real followers of Jesus, that real Christians, are called to live out in this world as children of heaven. Because with Jesus coming, the kingdom has begun. And so that must mean kingdom lives for kingdom people lived in the king's presence. Now remember, Matthew begins his gospel, doesn't he, announcing the arrival of the king. Long promised, but now here. Jesus Christ, the son of David, the great king, the son of Abraham, the great progenitor of Israel. And the first two chapters that we know so well from Christmas, they proclaim the arrival of the one who is born king of the Jews. But he's worshipped, isn't he, by Gentile wise men who come from far away. The world will worship this king. And then in chapters 3 and 4, we have John the Baptist announcing him to the world. Look, says John, your king has come. So repent. When God's promised king comes, it means that the ultimate rule of God is here on earth, both in salvation and in judgment. And that's why John cries, Repent. Because his winnowing fork is in his hand, he says, he's come to judge between the wheat and the chaff in the world of men. And then you have the voice, don't you, from the Father in heaven itself at Jesus' baptism. And he declares, this is my beloved son. And the clear implication is, is the same thing as what he says explicitly later on on the Mount of Transfiguration. This is my beloved son, so listen to him. Listen to him. Teach and proclaim the real truth about his kingdom. 
exactly as Jesus begins to do here, beginning at Matthew 4, verse 17. Because he and he alone has got the authority to do that and to tell us what his kingdom is and isn't. Now that's so important to remember, is it not? Because there's so much confusion today, just as there was confusion in Jesus' day about what the kingdom of God really means. In his day, many people just thought it was to do with earthly things. It was to do with political liberation. It was to do with social change. It was to do with economic improvement and so on. Well, that's just the same today, isn't it? For many, that is what the church should be all about. Social work and politics, all the really important pressing matters of this world, climate change and so on. I'm sure that's one reason why people have become thoroughly bored with the church in this country, just as they become thoroughly bored with politics in this country. But no, says Jesus, look, look at chapter 4, verse 17. It's the kingdom of heaven that he's talking about. It's something far, far greater than your feeble thinking can begin to contemplate. Now, if you want to hear what is the truth about God's kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, We have to listen to the king of heaven who has come to earth to tell us. It's only he who can tell us about his kingdom. It's only he who can tell us what it means to be people of that kingdom. And that's what he's doing in this, what we call the Sermon on the Mount. He's teaching his disciples. He's teaching those he has called to follow him as his people. He's teaching them nothing less than the counterculture that brings the way of heaven to earth. Even now. And demonstrates the presence of heaven on earth with unmistakable and distinctive flavor. Like the challenging tang and sting of salt. And brings the clarifying brightness of light that illuminates the very road to heaven itself. So that's the first thing. The kingdom of heaven. The Sermon on the Mount is about the kingdom of heaven. And it's for those who call themselves disciples, Christians. It's the Lord of heaven himself teaching us about true heavenly righteousness, the righteousness to which we have been called. Teaching us all about true kingdom discipleship, about being what we are as the people of the king. But notice also in verse 1 of chapter 5, notice also what he says about the crowds. Seeing the crowds, he went and sat down and began to teach his disciples. So it is his disciples Jesus is teaching directly, but he knows full well, doesn't he, that the crowds are all around listening in. And so, of course, Jesus is very consciously, but indirectly, speaking also to the crowds. Think about um, politicians today. Think about uh, David Cameron as he's going all around Europe, meeting with the different European leaders, trying to broker his new deal for the European Union. And there's a press conference in Belgium or Holland or France or wherever it is. And he is speaking directly to the cameras in Belgium or France or whatever it is. But he knows very well that he is speaking for an audience back home on the six o'clock news. So he's speaking to them, but for us. And as Jesus expounds the wonder of his kingdom, he is also still very consciously appealing to those who are still outside those who are not yet committed disciples. And he's appealing to them to enter his kingdom and to become disciples with the rest. Not because he's giving them requirements uh, to follow that if they do well enough, they'll earn a place among his disciples. No, not that. No, he's describing the life of those who are already his people because they are penitent people. People who have sought grace and forgiveness in him and have found it in abundance in Jesus Christ. But you see, the paradox of the message of grace in Christ is that it not only comforts the penitent and the humble follower, but it also convicts the proud and the impenitent. God's grace not only responds to repentance, but God's grace provokes repentance in the human heart. So really, there's no divide, is there? between preaching and teaching that edifies and encourages disciples and that which evangelizes and calls those who are still in the crowds in the outside world. Because the gospel of the cross of Jesus both shapes entry into the kingdom of God and into the life of discipleship, and it goes on shaping 
the life of true discipleship every single day right till the end of our lives. And what that means is that there is something vital here in Jesus' teaching on the Sermon on the Mount, whoever you are. If you're a Christian of many, many years following, well, he's speaking to you just as Jesus spoke to his first disciples then. But if you're not a Christian, if you're still in the crowd, if you're interested, if you're listening in wanting to find out more, well, it's also for you. It's for you to listen in to the teaching of Jesus about his kingdom to his people so that you also will discover all that you need to know about his kingdom. And so that you also can find the way to life which only Jesus as the king can offer you and show you. So if that's you, let me encourage you to keep coming on Sunday mornings as we study this together. Keep listening and give Jesus Christ the consideration that surely he deserves, surely any intelligent, inquisitive person deserves to give to Jesus. Well, that's really all by way of introduction to our series, and it's a necessarily waggle on the tee because we have to understand what we're studying. But in the time left this morning, I want to concentrate, before we get right into the Sermon on the Mount, I want to concentrate on more of this issue of what what differentiates the person who is already a disciple of Jesus in verse 1 from those who are still really among the crowds, interested as they may be. That is a vital question, isn't it? And it's what verses 18 to 22 of chapter 4 make very clear for us. And I want us to focus on that now so we're absolutely clear before we finish this morning on what this difference is. Let's focus on these verses for a few minutes because they show us so very clearly that the beginning of all true Christian discipleship is in the sovereign call of Jesus himself. And it's a call to a life of exclusive loyalty to him alone as King and Lord. And that loyalty is manifest in submission to his sovereign commands. See, Matthew here is making an astounding claim. He's saying that Jesus alone has the power to call people into the kingdom of heaven. Follow me is Jesus' command to these men. And we're told twice, immediately they followed him. And Matthew's telling us that Jesus alone has the authority to command the ways of God's eternal heavenly kingdom. He's telling us that this man has the power and the authority of the God of heaven himself to command and to control in his kingdom. And disciples, people who belong to the kingdom of God, are simply people who have answered that call and have submitted to that authority. They've heard the voice of Jesus calling them to obey, to submit to his kingly rule over their whole life, and they have obeyed. And they've joined the community of those who gladly live under his exclusive authority, under his sovereign rule. And what that means, according to these verses, in Jesus' own words, is that they have become both true followers and true fishers. Because Christ's call has two clear aspects, doesn't it? It's a call with complete authority and it's a call with a commanding purpose. It's very clear in these verses, isn't it, that Jesus' call is a call with complete authority. Verse 19, follow me. In verse 20, immediately they left their nets and followed him. In verse 22, immediately James and John also left their father, their boats, and they followed him. What amazing authority. It's probably not the very first time these men have met Jesus. John's gospel suggests to us they've spoken already. But here is the decisive moment that changes their future. It is a word of command. And immediately they respond. Those of you who have employees, can you get your employees to respond immediately like that? Those of you with children, not a chance. Can your boss get you to respond with that kind of authority and immediacy. It's astonishing in in itself, isn't it? It's a call to unique submission. But you see, there's far more to it than just that. This is also a, a universal call that we're being shown here. It's a call for the obedience of all peoples to Jesus Christ. And the context here tells us that plainly. It's absolutely loaded with significance. Look at verse 18. 
We're told, and it's emphasized, that Jesus is in Galilee. And if you look above to verse 12 and verse 15 again, we're told there he was in Galilee, Galilee of the Gentiles. And we're quoted the the promises from the prophets that in the latter days, God's saving light would shine and call people from all nations, from among the Gentiles and the pagans, to join the light of God's Israel. On them too has the light shined. You see, Matthew is saying, well, this is that. It's fulfilled. This is the beginning of the climax of world history. Jesus is the king of the whole world. And he's come. And so when he calls, you listen. You act. You follow him immediately. And that is what a disciple is. That's what a Christian is. It's someone who's recognized that in Jesus Christ, you hear the call of the eternal ruler of this whole world. And so you've bowed the knee to him and acknowledged him as sovereign Lord. See, there's so much confusion, isn't there, today even about what a Christian actually is. People think it's to do with all sorts of religious things, all sorts of moral things, all sorts of ceremonial things and so on. But no, at at its heart, it's much, much more simple than that. It's not really to do with religion in that sense at all. It's all about relationship, isn't it? It's simply about recognizing that the climax of world history has come in the person of Jesus Christ. And therefore, that people of all nations, of all cultures, whoever they are, must submit to Jesus Christ uniquely. Whether your background's Jewish, like Simon and Andrew and these other men, or whether it's Gentiles, pagans, atheists, or Muslims, or Hindus, or Buddhists, or anybody else. If the climax of world history has come and the King of Heaven has come, then you must submit to his supreme authority. You must follow him and forsake all others. And that's a Christian disciple. That's what makes you a citizen of God's heavenly kingdom. Nothing else, and certainly nothing less. And notice, it's not just some sort of vague intent here. It's clear here that this is a whole of life transformation, a whole turnaround in life's commitments that is requested and is involved here. They leave everything in their life, their nets, their boats, their their livelihood, their family. And they follow Jesus Christ. That's what it means to follow Jesus. It's a whole life loyalty. People sometimes talk about following football. I'm sometimes asked by people, do you follow football? Well, for me, it's just a matter of vague interest. I look at the scores, I read the reports, I maybe go to the odd game, but there's no real commitment in my life to football. But the true fan, the people who sing, follow, follow, we will follow Rangers. Well, out in the snow yesterday in the blizzards, they were there. In the good times and the bad, and it's mostly been bad, they're there. They follow their club. Of course, the sad thing is they follow because their team really is their God in many ways. They follow with the zeal of lifelong commitment. Well, it's crazy to do that, isn't it? It's crazy to devote your life to such complete subjection unless it is to follow one who truly is divine, who truly can answer all the needs of human life, who truly is the source of meaning in all life and in all eternity. Well, the disciple, the true Christian, is someone who has said, I will follow Jesus because he is the Lord of heaven and earth and because his call is the divine call. It is a call of complete authority. And notice, secondly, that it is a call with a commanding purpose. It's not just to follow, but it is to join the mission of the Messiah himself. True disciples, true Christians, according to Jesus, it means becoming, verse 19, fishers of men. And that's because, you see, the true disciple understands what the coming of Jesus means for this world and therefore shares with him the urgent task of gathering out of this perishing world those that Jesus the Messiah has come to rescue. 
to rescue from the imminent coming of the judgment of God which Jesus himself proclaims. Jesus' mission is a rescue mission. It's to fish people out of the coming floods of judgment. Well, we know and we've seen a lot, haven't we, about people being fished out of the terrible calamity of coming floods. That's what Jesus is talking about here. And if you doubt me, just read on to the end of the sermon in chapter 7, verse 25 to the end. You'll see that is his ultimate focus. He's talking about coming floods of judgment. So, so don't misunderstand Jesus' talk here about fishing. Don't think Jesus is, is picturing a, uh, painting a picture of gentle fly fishing on a lovely summer day in some pretty river in the highlands where you relax and you switch off and you, you eat your sandwiches and you enjoy the scenery. No, no, no. The men he's talking to here were real fishermen. They plied their trade in the wind and the waves and the cold and the wet and the dark. They put out great nets straining to pull in hauls of fish in order to make a living. Fishing was their livelihood. Fishing was their whole life. They were totally immersed in the strenuous task of fishing. But now, Jesus says, all of that energy, all of that effort, all of that devotedness must focus on a new kind of fishing, a more urgent focus, a vital fishing. Fishing for men. Fishing to pull them out of the waters of judgment and rescue them into my heavenly kingdom of grace. In chapter 13, verse 47 of Matthew's gospel, Jesus explicitly says that the kingdom of heaven is like a net being thrown out into the sea to pull out fish. And he says that the judgment of God is like the sorting of fish, good from the bad. That's what he's talking about here. And he's saying that the true Christian has someone who has realized all of that. And that in Jesus' coming and in Jesus' gospel, the urgent intimation to the world is given of the need for worldwide rescue of human beings from the flood of judgment that is to come. People of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And so it must be, mustn't it, all hands on deck. It must be everyone to the task of fishing with Jesus for his kingdom of grace. Fishing like that for a Christian, a real Christian, can't possibly be a spectator sport. Can't just be a part-time recreation, can it? It's not that kind of fishing at all. No, 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 it's a whole-of-life business. And that's why for these early disciples, their whole previous life was left behind. And often it is true like that when Jesus calls someone to follow him. Very often it does mean a change of direction, a change of occupation in their earthly life. But for every true follower of Jesus, there is a necessary change in direction, a necessary change in priority in life, even if you, you're not necessarily changing your trade or your profession. And that's the real emphasis here. It's all about the commanding purpose of Christ's call, which is to see that, that his mission must now take precedence over every other thing in life, whether domestic or personal or professional, because Christ's kingdom has begun and nothing else can have priority in our lives. And therefore, a disciple, a, a real follower of Jesus, a Christian, is someone who's grasped that. And who acts on it and puts Christ's mission of salvation of men and women from all nations first above everything else in their earthly life, devotes their lives to being a disciple and a disciple maker, a fisher of men, because that is the commanding purpose of Christ's call. And it is a call with complete authority. And so it really is as simple as that, isn't it? That's not to say, of course, every one of us can be like Billy Graham, some great evangelist like that. Now, of course, some people do have very special gifts of evangelism, whether it's remarkably being a personal evangelist or, or being able to talk to great crowds like that. But mission is the task of the whole church as a body. 
Not that some are fishers and others are spectators. No, the true disciple will always be marked out by making this great priority the priority above everything else in life. The true disciple will always be determined to find their place in the fishing boat, if you like. All hands on deck for all they're worth. The true disciple will be leaving aside many good and worthwhile other things in order to do that. Maybe forgoing some work advancements and opportunities. Or some of their spending, some of their leisure time, some of the travel they could do, some of the luxuries they could have, whatever it is, some of the me time, as we say today. Forgo some of these things in order to give Jesus and his mission and his kingdom work the absolute priority in our lives. Whether it's bringing others to hear about Jesus at church where they know that the Lord promises to be in the midst to reveal himself to people or to Christianity explored or to doing one-to-one -one reading the gospel with somebody. Whether it's giving a night up that you could be re reading the paper or watching TV or watching football to come and join in with Christ's people praying for the mission as Christ has commanded us to do. Whether it means leaving your family at home one night a week and coming and cooking for Christianity Explored or Release the Word or the International Bible Study or whatever it is so people can hear the gospel and learn Christ. Or whether it's giving money that really stretches you financially, not just a token tithe of your income in order to help the mission of the church, to bless many, to reach more with the gospel. See, what Jesus is saying is these are all the kinds of things that mark out his disciples. His Christians mark them out from the crowd of people who are interested but, but still not committed, still outsiders. These are real followers and real fishers. Or as Jesus puts it himself a little later on, real hearers and doers of his word whose lives are actually, in reality, devoted to being disciples and to making disciples for Jesus Christ. So friends, as we finish this morning, that leaves us with a question, doesn't it? I think every one of us here. Is that really me? Am I actually, according to Jesus' definition, am I a real disciple? Have I actually answered that call of complete authority? Have I really understood the urgency of the summons of Christ, the King of the world, to join him in his mission as the top priority for my earthly life? Is that really true of me? Or have I actually just been listening in as a spectator from a distance? As if, um, as if being near to Jesus' real mission, as if being around Jesus' people is actually the only thing that matters. Well, that's not so, says Jesus. Read on to chapter 7, verse 21, and you'll see he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter my kingdom... Not everyone who sings songs, who hears words, who does impressive things. No, says Jesus, it's those who hear my words and do them. Do what I command. The people who belong to Jesus' kingdom are the people who have answered his call of complete authority and commanding purpose. To follow him and to devote their lives henceforth to fishing with him. Whatever the cost in terms of family, in terms of finance, in terms of their future. Follow me, says Jesus, and I will make you fishers of men. That's a command and it's a promise from the king of time and eternity. So we better listen, hadn't we? Let's pray. Lord, may we hear your voice pleading with our hearts in grace and calling our lives with sovereign authority. Grant us, we pray, the obedience of faith so that we don't resist you to our eternal loss, but rather gladly bow the knee to you as our Lord and our Master, in whose service is perfect freedom and in whose kingdom alone is to be found ultimate and abundant joy. 
So hear us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're going to sing as we close hymn number 857. Jesus calls us above the tumult of our life's wild, restless sea. Day by day, his voice re-echoes saying, Christian, follow me. Number 857. pray. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with you all now and always. Amen.